All right, thank you everyone for being here today. I'd like to welcome you again and uh, on our final day of our festival. This is the 12th iteration of Puppets in the Green Mountains just around the bend. This is our access through the arts panel, illuminating converging pathways. Thank you to our live audiences and our online audiences for being with us today. And thank you to HowlRound and Fact TV for being able to stream this for us, to close caption it, and of course archive it online so you all can either take a look or if anyone was, was unable to join us today, they still get a chance to take part in these important conversations. These panels allow us to connect our audiences, our artists, the conversations being had during the performances and outside the performances, and they help, that, help those conversations to ripple out into the community and the world beyond. So we're very excited to have you with us today. I would like to thank our youth facilitator, Alex Aether, for being with us today and for leading this panel, as well as our panelists. And of course, our funders who make this festival possible, the new, uh, excuse me, the new England Foundation for the Arts, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Clues Fund, and the Wolf Kahn Foundation. Uh, we thank them profusely for their support and for your support as well. Coming to live theater, donating to live theater helps us to do what we do and to continue doing what we do. So thank you again. Uh, and without further ado, I hand it over to Alex. Thank you. Hello everyone, um, my name is Alex. I am an actor and performer of 10 years and a human of 15 years. Um, I'm so grateful to be here today with all of these fantastic artists. Um, today we have Deborah, Deborah Hunt, um, Sarah Nolan, Shoshana Bass, De Hernandez, Willow O'Farrell, and Maria Pugnetti. Um, so how this is going to work is I'm going to pass the mic to you guys when you want to answer a question. We have a few questions. And then for the last 15 minutes will be reserved for questions from our audience. So if you have a question, just hang it up there. Um, so I'm going to pass you the mic to just introduce yourself and your part in the festival this year. Hello, um, I'm Deborah Hunt and uh, along with Gibo Guerrero, we performed Road of Useless Splendor, um, Puppeteer, Mask Maker, and Human. I'm going to take that from you because I think it's very good. <laughs> and super happy to be here. Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Nolan, and I am ensemble member and director of Feral. I think we all have to project a little more. Oh, oh hello, everyone. No. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I know. It's, it's for the people out there. Uh, I am the director and ensemble member of Feral, and we opened this week. It was very exciting. Had our world premiere. Uh, and, and a big fan of everyone at the festival. Hello, I'm Shoshana Bass. I'm the artistic director of Sandglass Theater and the director of the festival and the creator of Feral, <laughs> along with this amazing company. And I am part human most of the time. And um, yes, that's, that's me. Hola, my name is De Hernandez, and I'm also an ensemble member um, and play part in the devising team for Feral. Happy to be here. Uh, I'm, hi, I'm Willow Farrell, and I'm a local documentary filmmaker, and I was filming Feral two nights ago, and I've worked with Sandglass a lot, and my partner was the former, is a former chair of the board of Sandglass, so um, and I've gotten to work with Maria, too, so, yeah. Hi, I'm Maria. I'm a technical designer um, that works with Shoshana and Sandglass sometimes and has been involved in Feral since its early days. Um, and I was doing some lighting and sound and filling in for our musician Molly as the mushroom in the production. Um, um, yeah, that's me. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. okay, good. All right, 
So our first question is a very broad one, but you can answer it in whatever way you, feels you feel is appropriate. Walk us through your process of creating art. Are the... <laughs> 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 and whoever wants to start, I'll just run the mic over to you. I'll take a stab at it. Oh, yay. All right. Starting point. Very different. Mock-ups. Very important. <laughs> Testing. Experiments. Very important. Test audience. Really great if you can have one. Going back to the drawing board happens a lot. Uh, take something out, put something back. Uh, and then perform it for two years, and then it's, and then it's done. I think. <laughs> If only it were so easy to just like do the one thing at a time. I always feel like there's so many parallel trains running at once. And, the, yeah. and before all that, fundraising. Yeah. Oh my goodness. But to fundraise, you also need to have something to show that you're asking. So you have to do unpaid work before so that you can ask for money to do the next thing. And in this country, you're also marketing all your own stuff. You're also producing all your own stuff. You're also fine. So there's... Apart from even just making the work and the creative process, there's just all these la other layers, I think, that I just want to throw in there Yes. Um, as part of that. Sarah is amazing <laughs> at prototyping um, and taught me a lot of lessons in that. Uh, but I think there's a seed moment for each work. And for me, um, we were talking about scenes that, that were there very easily from the beginning in a show. and stay the same, and they kind of contain the whole show. I think in Feral, our moment was the, the woman getting into the cage in the shadow was like, yes. it just happened easily, and it contained the show in it. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes those little seed moments are, I think, are the most important piece of a process when you, when you find it, and you know it's just kind of been gifted to the process and to the piece. <laughs> yes. um, I think each uh, work is, for me, quite different. Sometimes it's very clear if there's a funding opportunity, a grant to be written, it's like being specific but very general at the same time so that if you get it, they don't nail you down to what you said a year ago. And if it's not, it can be... And so it acts as a um, point of departure too, a peer for uh, Like, okay, there's a deadline. So something has to be done in that time. The other thing for me, for this show, we didn't have funding and I decided I wanted a show that could fold. That everything, sh or many things could fold up. So I began to make the mask and the first... Um, costume, and also at the same time, I live in Puerto Rico, Giro lives in Baltimore, and I go there for Christmas time. So I went there and found in a second-hand shop some knitting needles and some yarn, the color of the mask I'd made. So it was like, I used to knit. I think I'll knit in Christmas time. It's a good thing. It's cold, because you don't really knit in Puerto Rico. It's too hot. <laughs> so, so things came very piecework. I mean, very uh, patchwork, patchwork. So it was a process that we had no idea until we, I mean, we, we, had, we shared the painting of the uh, pop-ups, et cetera, et cetera. But we met in, I had some work in Italy, we met there to actually do the montage. And we had, we worked on some stuff that needed to be finished, and we had everything laid out. And it was like, what are we gonna do with this? Be arbitrary. First, second, third, first. okay, that's good enough. And then it was just layering in things and some things work, some let's, I mean, it was very patchwork. 
and that's kind of how I work. I'm never too sure until the end what it is. Mm. So. Uh, I was just thinking of something, well, I love what you said, Sarah, and really ex it's cool to hear how puppetry process or theater piece is similar in a lot of ways to documentary film. Um, but I was just thinking of something that Julia Reichert said, who's one of my uh, like load stars in documentary filmmaking. She did a lot of labor rights and feminist documentaries, but she said, I was in a workshop with her, um, and she said that you have the central part of making a piece is finding the beating heart of the story. Why are you making it? And, and you have to just cleave to that over and over again at every step of the process, because you can get really lost in like, what is hot right now in documentary film, or what, what would be sexy, or what, you know, oh, I just, I'm really attached to this one scene that I, or I, you know, this shot is so beautiful, it has to go in. But if it's not working for the beating heart, then it has to go. Mm -hmm. and, it, and when she said that, it really helped me uh, like make decisions mm -hmm. along the way. Um, echoing everything that everyone else has said and also just adding that there is a little bit of a like a, a moment of haunting <laughs> that happens where there's a resonant image that's kind of stirring around and and then maybe you have to put it down and get back to work and the life goes on and then it comes back and you're just so curious and fascinated and then you and then you go back and you revisit this image or this character or whatever it is that's actually um, there's a little bit of a romance, I think, with me and my creative process where um, life takes over, but then if there's still a little spark, I'll go back to it. And, um, and maybe 10 years later, there's still a spark, and I'm like, we've been long distance for so long, but, but it's time that we reconnect. And then I'll be like, maybe next week I can, I can plan some studio time with you. And, and then... <laughs> And then we get back into the studio together, and then, you know, like, things get carried away, and so then, but then you have to, like, I think the crucial part is, is that, like, if I had it as an artist, if somebody would just, like, basically just feed me under my door, like, would just deliver things, I would be glad to be, like, in this whimsical, like, curious laboratory of development all the time, but... I think what's so great as far as actually, say, bringing Farrell to the stage is there's <clears throat> project management artists, there's accountability, there's deadlines, there's grant writing, there's administrative stuff, there's tenacity and ferocity, and like, and Shoshana had the moment of romance with the image, and I remember because we've been friends for a while, seeing the spark of Farrell in her, in her notebooks and seeing the images and the drawings and being like, ooh, this is juicy. And then, <laughs> and then but, but that could have just been this whimsical idea that just lived in her, her illustrated, in her notebooks. But I think the, the difference between bringing something to a stage and to an audience is, is that you have to sort of surrender to the fact that you need project management, you need deadlines, you need accountability, you need other people, you can't just necessarily, sometimes you need other people, and whether that's um, just having the humility to know that I'm just an idea person that likes to just be like in my studio, but I need somebody that's a very grounded person that, um, and I think that's what's so beautiful about ensemble work, and um, is that you, there's this, you can chart the course ahead and you can take that romantic idea, that curiosity, that fascination, and eventually, if you have all the components together, the, the team that you need, the funding that you need, the space that you need, and like you, you handle the, like, the actual physical reality that we live in as artists, you know? Like, if you can manage that, you can bring something to an audience and then without any knowledge of what's going to happen, you just show up and then it happens and then you, it's, it's pretty magical because, because people, people perceive something that you didn't perceive because you've been so, you know, in the wheels of like grinding it out and after you were once inspired and then you, so, so that's what I would add to that is the romance and the pragmatism that is required and the reality that has to shape us as artists, the, the context that we're living in and how we have to adapt to it and what resources we have to source and, um, and how much back pain we can endure. <laughs> Thank you.
No, I'll just add to everything. Um, to that, I would say like I have devoted my practice to be one of collaborative processes. So the one piece that I will add to all of that when it comes to creating something, it's um, just coming, coming with a, you know, with your full presence, your uh, best attitude that sometimes flips throughout the day and whatever, if you're experiencing whatever with your human um, lifeless, uh, lifelessness. Or, um, but um, just coming there and, and then also trying to plug in and understanding how other people's processes are, uh, it has been very important um, in, in, my, in my practice. Um, so, so I can be, ideally I can be of service to what process it's been like, especially for people who um, are perhaps running with other, other many aspects of a production, right? If I have a niche where I'm, where I'm being part of that admin process, I know what it is to be like running a bunch of hats besides the creative hat. Um, but when I get to work in processes like this, that I get to just come and play, be an artist, you know? Um, also plugging in and trying to understand what's happening in the room and trying to see how we, we can be supportive of each other um, in trying to bring that vision that somebody, you know, that some other people have in the room. Um, it's, it's something that I, I, I feel very content that I'm a part of. Thank you so much. All right, our next question. What is the meaning of storytelling? How do you tell your story through your art? I'll let it marinate for a second. This is a very interesting question. Alex. Repeat the question, please. <laughs> what is the meaning of storytelling? How do you tell your story through your art? it down um okay just to get the ball rolling um i i'm actually pretty old-fashioned in that like i love um joseph campbell and the hero's journey and i think that storytelling is so so is so old you know ancient and we are so ancient that it's always like for me it's very comfortable falling finding a story that's compelling and that i can resonate with the characters in it and um and so I think it's um, storytelling has such a strong presence for me in my life and I think in, in art and um, when we're able to, to gather and in, have a collective story, I, we were just talking about this where we're in a space live in person and whether it's a fire or it's a theater, the lights come on and a world is created and we're all able to enter that world together and emotionally experience and breathe with the characters and, and go on this little tiny journey in a little hour <laughs> or whatever, go on this journey together where we're all, <gasps> you know, and like, and I think that there's something really beautiful about that that just is, is not going to go away no matter what is around the bend. I think us being able to gather for a story in person and that like electricity of like, I'm with people now and like, ooh, hey, the, the, just the little charge of that, the electricity of like the storyteller and the artist showing up and being actually there in front of you. And <clears throat> there's a little bit of, uh, I think it's a very old, visceral, very interesting experience that I think is not going anywhere and I've seen that with audiences where I was surprised to think that like they could be streaming something with that's like online but they they seem to have a real they seem to be really shaken up and stirred up by actually showing up to a live story to a, to a live event and surprisingly like um, somebody will be some like really macho no offense, I mean, Macho Man will be like, when I, I was doing a story where I had these little shadow dancers, ballerinas, and in, in the back, the person was like, yeah! <laughs> and like, I was like, whoa, I wouldn't have expected that, but like, it just speaks to us in this very, I don't know, something really deep, and speaking of a deep intuitive thing about just being able to participate in a collective story where we're all together, breathing together, 
experiencing all the tribulations of the story together, and then we we disband, and there's something really, um, I don't know, enriching about that in a whole sense way. It's not just the eyes perceiving a digital experience in a small screen. It's it's something that's very alive, very three dimensional, and um, and very powerful, and can can reach people in a way that's not intellectual beyond their own perceptions and nar personal narratives. We can have the back and whoever wants. Oh no, you go, you go. Um, I was just responding to the second half of that question, which was about um, how, what stories we want to tell. How do you tell your story? How we tell it. Because I, I think it's so interesting that, okay, we have maybe an idea or a starting place that is personal to us, but we don't know what the story is. We come into the room, we're like, what? if we come in with curiosity, and it takes so much trust. And for me, that's the hardest part about a creative process is like, okay, I trust that the story will emerge as I'm working and the story that needs to be told will emerge as we're working. And sometimes it's like, oh no, we've lost. I don't even know what we were talking about. Why are we even doing this? Like you completely lose track of that. And then the work comes, comes back to you with what it needed or um, listening to, Zavi talk about objects and in, in just intuiting stories from objects is that we have allies all around us to find story and discover story and what's my story when I look at this object is different than what's your story when you look at this object or this show and that what I love about art in that way is that everyone comes with their stories. It doesn't matter what my story is. I mean, it matters to me what my story is, and it matters to the process that I have my own stories that are part of it. But that doesn't mean the audience has anything to do with that. They come with their own stories. And I think that's so exciting. Mm. You wanna add something, Deborah? Um, I think it's, it depends which kind of storytelling we're talking about. Because um, when often we think of stories, we think of something linear and something that we've either heard before or that we've been brought up with, something that was told to us, so it's maybe verbal, something that we repeat, something has to do with memory, that has to do with <coughs> continuum. And then I think when there aren't any words, um, another kind of storytelling takes place because I feel uh, that my job is to create a complete world. So if I manage to create a complete world where I'm very sure about what I'm doing in it, and that story may be linear, it may be happening on different uh, verticalities as well, so this has to relate to this later on, whatever, as long as I'm sure of it and I am believing in that world, then it's not my job to, my job is to present that the, the audience will re joins in and hopefully joins this, this world. So I'm often very confused about storytelling anyway because I think of storytelling as a verbal, more of a verbal story, uh, uh, oral storytelling, but I think it happens, I think the stories that happen are woven in the present, in present time, so we all have our memories of what something might be, or something touches those memories, and then because we are in present time, another thing is created, and that's the interesting story, mm -hmm. in a way. Uh, what was my thought? The, oh yeah, I feel like start, uh, for documentary filmmaking, I, f I feel like curiosity and openness towards others is really what I'm really drawn to. And so in a way, it's a relief to get out of myself, you know, talking to people, asking them questions, actually, and not just people, but animals, other life. Um, I've been filming 
Birds recently with Fred Homer, I'm making a documentary about Fred Homer, some of you might know him. He rehabilitates wild, injured wild birds. Mm -hmm. And just filming, like I filmed a pigeon in close up a couple weeks ago and his, the morning light was hitting the, the pigeon's eye and it was like looked like molten lava. And mm -hmm. he was looking at me and I was looking at him. I don't know the pigeon's pronouns, but <laughs> there. <laughs> I was just had a feeling maybe. But it was just like, it was this shocking feeling of being outside of myself, completely undressed in front of another being who is, who's regarding me, regarding them. And that's like, that's where it's at for me about documentary filmmaking and it never gets old. And then later often in the process, like I was talking about the beating heart, I realized, oh, I'm making this film because of the generational gendered violence in my family, even though the film was about indigenous women in the US fighting against you know, sexual assault and fighting for tribal sovereignty, I realized actually the beating heart of why I was making that film was really to repair harm in my family too. And that was very important. It took a couple years for me to figure out why personally I was making the film. Um, and so that's obviously very, very personal. But the curiosity and openness and interest in reaching out towards other people is really what instigated it. So it's like curiosity towards others and personal beating heart, I guess. So. I'll add something. I think, ladies, no. <laughs> I, think I wanted them to finish their sign. Uh, I, I think for me, it's all, puppetry is so visual and the visual storytelling comes from distilling. You're just constantly distilling, boiling it down, boiling it down. Do you really need that uh, little flower there? You know, like what, and you know, my dad was a graphic designer and, and he always talked about when you're making logos, you take out, you take out, you take out, you take out, and then you're like, that's too much, you put one thing back. And I think a lot about that editing process and as a, if, background in film, I think talking about the heartbeat, what is the heartbeat? I also think about montage and and if you have this image next to this image, and that's what we're doing is, is we're making these montages of material, right? It's like I have this material, but then it's juxtaposed with this material and that equals the meaning. And so I think that experimentation is so important to get to that meaning that's that actually resonates, you know, and and for it to be a successful or to be a, a meaningful story, it has to be, oh, instead of, huh, <laughs> you know, I and and I think that there's a I think there's joy also in the huh moments, um, but even in storytelling, I I use a lot of humor, and I think what I like about humor is that sometimes it can be very factual. It's either a laugh or there's no laugh. <laughs> and in that way, it's, it's landing or it's not. I think we were talking about that the other day. Um, I don't know, with someone, with all of you. Uh, but yeah, so I think distilling and, and humor and, and to tell, and especially with puppetry, to tell stories of growth and change, you know, I think is really important. Okay. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> all right. Another, another, another deep one. Um, <laughs> what defines you the most? How does that show in your work and life? And this can be... <laughs> um, it, it can either be like an identity or something that's happened in your life that you feel like you still carry with you today. Um, there's no right or wrong answer. Again, I will let it marinate. <laughs> what defines us? What defines us? And what, what defines you the most? And how does that show in your work and life? <laughs> Maybe some of you can answer it for uh, someone else that you know on the panel. Ooh, <laughs> like, oh, that defines me. That is so awesome. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Indigestion. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I was just thinking. Do you guys know each other fairly? I don't know. Do you know each other? 
Yeah, I think it's hard because it's also hard to define yourself mm -hmm. and and to choose. Like no one wants to lock that in. You want to stay open to. I like being de defined by the people I surround myself with. For example, that is a conscious choice that I make now. That isn't. Oh, I happen to be born in Southern Vermont. I happen to be born to. Uh, I'm the daughter of puppeteers. I, uh, yeah, they're all part of who I am. But the active choices of what we do, I think, is maybe more exciting for me because we all have circumstance and all that in our lives. So, and, and all of that is going to play out in our work, I think. You were just giving an example of how that plays out in your work, Willow, of where you come from. And yes, of course, we're always trying to integrate pieces of ourselves through our work. We're always trying to, I think, heal parts of ourselves through our work or follow, follow things that we think we need or feel we are drawn to but don't know why. And that's, those are the things that are undefined. And I think it's actually the things that are undefined that are interesting to me. I'll just add one thing. I think myself, the myself part is the most detrimental to my art because I think my ego and my sense of self when it's involved in my art is, is when I start to sabotage the work because the idea of performing it will be so humiliating to me. Why am I writing a song about squirrels? Like, wh how could I ever perform this? And, and, and then also bump into people at the co-op after. I've sung a little ditty about a squirrel. And so I think um, defining myself is, <clears throat> is the thing that is most harmful to me as an artist because I think what drives me as an artist is curiosity is is like when I see something beautiful, it's reverence. It's also, I think when the eagle gets entangled, it's like, how can I vindicate my existence as a weirdo? You know, like if I make something really cool, then will people say, yeah, she's a little weird, but she makes cool stuff. Like, how do I make myself feel like enough? All of these things, like, how am I going to validate all of the things, the adversity or the eccentricity that I've been enduring, you know, with art? I think that's when it gets to be um, a real, like, it, it, it interferes with my creative process because my creative process is sort of about, more about following, like, not knowing how something's gonna turn out, having the courage to be able to sort of say, um, this is really wasteful of energy and time and resources. This is potentially going to embarrass me, all of that stuff. Like, I think the more that I can disentangle myself from the process of working and just enjoy the tempo of creating and feeling like I was born to just be working with my hands and doing stuff and work like just to be interested in something a process as opposed to the r routine predictability so I think um, so I think the more I disentangle my identity with the work, the more pleasant, the more interesting it is. And that's the most challenging thing I've ever had to encounter as an artist because it's um, as soon as the self comes in and says, this is gonna represent me, is when I start to sabotage my creative process and make it miserable for myself. The more I feel identified with it is the more miserable the process is gonna be. This isn't good. No one's gonna like this. This is if this is how I present. So I think a surrendering, a humility, and like kind of a, a, a sense of sort of um, playfulness is something that I want to cultivate in creative process and less about me um, is, is that. <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> I, I can go if you don't want um, to. <laughs> you, go, you can go, I'll go, go we can go next <laughs> Somebody asked me uh, in Puerto Rico, what do you feel? You're from New Zealand, but you've lived a long time in Puerto Rico. Where do you belong? Who, you know, and I, out of my mouth came, I am a citizen of my work. And that, this is quite recent, and um, because it's the place where I feel most alive. It's a place where I've, uh, that I've inhabited, if it is a place for a while, and it's also something that can be geographically like a tiny island or a vast plain, 
It can have be full. It can also be absolutely barren. And it's the place where I can trust the most. And I think, uh, it, to me, it's a rich place. And that's where I go from. Whether I'm successful or not, or people like it or not, is not the point. Uh, it's the work is, I don't do much else. <laughs> I don't have much of a social life. I don't go to parties so much. I don't. So this is super, this is, yeah, I'm a citizen of my work. That's how I define myself. Um, I think that one thing that defines a lot of what I do is I do feel I have an ability to read a room and vibe, vibe check, I guess. <laughs> I, uh, growing up, I had someone in my life who was uh, dealing with bipolar disorder. And so that ability to go into a room and know immediately, like, the vibe and, and then adjust accordingly, I think I, I bring that to a lot of my collaborations and, and being able to be speckle. I feel like sometimes... I can spackle the, wow. you know, spackle the room, fill in the gaps, and, you know, and I think what's hard then about stepping into, like, a director role is, like, I don't know, what do you want? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, and so Shoshana was incredible because you have such strong vision, and it was really great to collaborate with you in that way because it was, like, I do have moments where I'm like, oh, okay, I know that that, that is it. that's it you know sometimes it clicks and and we'll uh you know we'll have really great discussions and that was that was a really fun for me to start to discover like oh i know what i want this to be uh and i think that's my challenge going forward is being like as i'm able to cr get to a place where i am creating my own work and not something that's a commission uh or you know, filling the desires of a paid gig, it's 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 a challenge. It's like, oh, I have to figure out what I want. <laughs> so that's my challenge, but also a, a real, I think, boon to myself. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'll I'll say I was trained as an architect. I'm an architect, but I don't practice it anymore. So, um, but it brings a whole aspect of myself uh, in, into my work, which is um, I tend towards problem solving. And it's al also architecture is a very social art. Um, and it's combined with science and all of that. So it, there's, there's a lot of me that it's very practical and logical and structurally, like I create structure to everything, to processes, to how things move, how whatever. And then over that, I can improvise, but I do require and need that structure. Um, and I think and I think that part of, of, of the, um, when I'm working in collaborative practices, I try to try, track that for others as well. Um, so yeah, I'll say that. Thank you so much, that was so enlightening. Next question. <laughs> what are the risks of developing art in the modern day? Um, one thing that like might come to mind is the use of technology, as there is more advanced technology now than there was. And do you feel as though it helps your work or hurts it? Anything along those lines? We're marinating once again. Say, I'll just say, say the question again. What are the risks of developing art in the modern day? You say the second part. What <laughs> risks of developing art in the modern day? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, no. You did have a second part. You said in oh. like the introduction of new technology. How that yes, th yeah. that was more a. Um, an extra nugget. You can grab onto it if you want or let it float away, whatever you so desire. Mm. 
Like I'm just if I need some time over there, okay? I'll just um, what I we were just discussing this because I think a lot of us are very hands-on artists, um, and I was just discussing this with the lovely Feral Ensemble members. Um, I'm very old tech, and I have and there's certain things that I'm just not going to participate in because I I and um, but I think. Not only am I old tech, but you're all old tech too. Um, and so, so I think with the, the introduction of things like AI and, and the presence of content that's always just flooding into our digital spaces, um, I think it's becoming less pleasant to be online. And I have this instinct that as artists, we're still gonna be here adapting and as human beings, we're still gonna be meeting. We, we might be even more compelled to be meeting in person because when AI is telling you this beautiful story about a brown panda bear that is eyes darting around because like, that is basically like compositing content in a way that's supposed to create an emotional arc for you to experience and it feels very dead and flat and it's just a place to space out. It's always going to be, I think, Right now, if I were to go outside and space out in a natural space where there's birds and there's sound, I think it's a more restorative and it's, it's the way that my body is made. And so I think, I don't know how the younger generations are, I'm, I'm not long for this life, um, but um, I'm not going to be able to wield the powers of AI to make my next magnum opus, but, um, but I think I love technology. I love because I'm somebody that doesn't have a lot of resources. I love being able to automate. I love being able to incorporate something into my little backpack that I can cart around and mean like I can do digital projection and sound and lights all in my little workstation. Totally amazing to me. I also think that um, it's not going to be a substitute for the experiences that we have in our little town, you know, and and there's an AI is not going to fix your toilet, and AI is not going to put on a wonderful shadow puppet show in front of a firelight or by torch or by stage light. I think um, we're still here adapting to the changes in our environments and in our um, in our economic systems. As artists, I think we've always had to be gritty, resourceful, and adaptable, and and endure, you know. And as people, and I think we're still doing that. Um, and then, yeah. Take it away. <laughs> I, I don't really use AI. I know filmmakers are using it more and more. I, I just haven't gotten around to it. I feel very open towards it. I feel like, you know, we have, people freaked out about the printing press. We're going to freak out. It's okay. We'll adapt and learn. There's some really bad things coming with it and some really good things. Uh, one thing, though, I'm just really, really nice to Siri. I'm very polite <laughs> because if they do take over, I want them to not, I want to not be on their shit list. <laughs> so say so please and thank that. you to Siri. Yeah. And <laughs> my partner made his, like his, you know, the, when you ask, is it Siri? The Google, whatever, Google voice, whatever Alexa. it is. Alexa. Well, we don't have an Alexa, but like when you talk to your phone and it talks back, he made it a male voice because he worries that AI is uh, super sexy. Well, it is because it's input from human generated, you know, it gets its information from the internet, which is super sexist and racist. Um, so he, he like had to change the voice into a male voice so that he doesn't like get used to ordering, a, you know, ordering a woman around, a female voice around. Yeah. And then his sister, his sister just lambasted him about it. She was like, oh, you won't have a woman give you the directions on your phone? And he was like, ah! But she was you know, teasing him. But I, I do think it's really weird and interesting, the gendered voices on AI and like all of that and how people, I've heard people speak so rude and so pejoratively to AI, to their mm. Alexa or whatever, do this, do that. And I feel like that is big no-no. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm one of those that runs screaming in the opposite direction and is completely distrustful and terrified. Um, and I fully accept that, and I also accept that this is something that we'll be integrating 
somehow into the world. Um, so, yeah, and I'm, I'm interested to see how artists want to hear a little bit about the creation of how you used AI in the creation of your show. Um, because I think, uh, I'm still looking for the words, the, the tactile way of experiencing the world is all we have, really. We have this body and this way of um, being able to connect physically, face to face, with material, with nature, with ground. And um, this other thing, it's like it swirls in a place that I can't be and I don't know and I can't actually physically exist in. And so I don't know how to relate with it. And I, I am fearful of the danger to our imaginations um, and the, the strength of our imaginations because I think our imaginations are required to heal the world, are required to fix the many uh, troubles of our community that we live in or the different various communities we live in. And we need that tool. We need that tool more than anything uh, to keep keep a healthy world continuing. So I think that's the one place where I get very fearful if we start to rely on AI to do the work of our imaginations, um, then we put ourselves in a very dangerous place. All right. <laughs> um, my one thing I really, I, one thing that's important to me is to Eliminate as much fear, personal fear, as possible. I don't want to live fearfully. If I make mistakes, that's fine, whatever. Uh, so during the process of this work, and it was really very knit the road, make the costume, make the mask. I will say, a gazillion years ago, we went to libraries in past companies. This is, I mean, back in New Zealand. And we took out about 20 books. And we read them and we looked at the pictures and we looked at these and paintings here and we do, 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 we sort of scanned a world that we thought we might be useful for us in the next production. That was then. Um, and what happened with, uh, so this show, other, I was doing other projects, other projects, other shows, and so this developed very, very slowly. But the mask I had made, uh, the costume was, my cost, the first costume was together, decided on pop-ups, decided what they were, they were being painted. When, I think it was like January of 2021, 2000, something like that, I came across Mid Journey, which is a, uh, a thing for AI for images. And I went, what on earth is this? And I sort of, and it's, it was a mess. It was hard to understand how to get into. But then I did understand it, and I thought, what awful stuff is coming out of it? I mean, not to be, like, egotistical, but I didn't like much of what of the images that I saw. They personally... And then I decided, all right, I'm going to give it a go. And what I did was describe very, very precisely the mask character. And I went... So what this masked character is a traveler da, 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 walking towards a burning city, for instance. And then out of the soup comes some images. Sometimes interesting, sometimes not. And it was just like having, because we live in, for this show, we live in far away. So it was like having a strange... Uh, uh, accompaniment and then every now and again I just go okay once again the trap because it doesn't stay still it's constantly moving <clears throat> and I'd put in exactly the same and maybe this time it would be like I decided to broider the end of the nose red the beak and there with the embroidered nose and suddenly this other kind of whole look very very different so it was sort of it's interesting. I've never used um, uh, chat or writing because to me it's not, I'm not, I, 
I have enough good idea. I think they're good ideas. <laughs> if I got was paid a dollar for each of them, I, we could all, I'd buy you all everything you ever desired. But, so I'm not interested in content. I know I'm confident in my own generation of content. Now the interesting thing, like playing with this as I was creating things, is that I've like, um, for, off and on for years I've made wings. And I have this idea of fabulous wings. And then the, like the uh, folks who do, what's it called? Oh, um, cosplay. Wow, fantastic wings. These people can make, and I'm going, damn, my wings are always funky and whatever. <laughs> And I wanted this character, one of them, to have wings. And so I put in exactly the same words, more specific, more just like the character, and out come the wings that you saw in the show. That's the only thing that's actually come directly. It was like I saw it and I went, this is it. These are the wings. I can make these. They can fit inside a thing. It's not going to be Mission Impossible. They're portable. They look like us. And so that, to me, that project... Then, I mean, we started rehearsing, and I haven't looked at it again. So to me, it's an interesting thing. It's beyond our grasp already. It's moving. It's developing. I'm not interested in it for writing essays for myself or descriptions. Occasionally, I might... The newer versions of it are horrible. Everything is now perfect. And I like the old versions when there was eight fingers and <laughs> strange things like that. I like that version. I don't like the new versions. But it's kind of like, to me, I'm not, I wouldn't use it to write anything. Because I don't find, it doesn't occur to me to do it. Probably I'm vaguely interested to see what in video comes out. But not, not even that so much, because I like, I, I like other people's video. But it's a taste thing. But I mean, every, when they developed the Moog synthesizer, everybody said that's the end of music. It was people threw up their hands in horror. So I, you know, I'm more, more worried about the use of that technology, not in the creative, but in, in fact, surveillance, war. That, that to me is super, super terrifying so I wanted to mention that last night um, bueno earlier in the afternoon or something we we went to see the Shan's um, shadow show um, and besides it being a really beautiful show um, we have in Puerto Rico we have a lot of power outages like so consistent and I think you brought it up last time uh, uh, when, when it comes to thinking of how to keep creating work but also work that you can present that is not highly dependent on lights and sound and you know like that it's alive and that you can actually put it uh, put it out without worrying about that um, I was yeah I was really uh, uh, moved by by that piece last night because I was like you know, we've done shadow puppet shows in a, in the street when the students are on strike, and it took me there. Like, there are many ways of creating, of keep doing this work that it's that it doesn't rely on on all that tech. Not to say that that really it 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 moves things quickly or it makes. Um, I cannot imagine necessarily at this point feral without without the lights and without the sound, um, because it, it really creates a mood and it really it let us move in the stage in darkness or this or that. But, but that it keeps, it keeps in, in my problem solving brain, it's always like that. We're, we're having so many issues back home when it comes to access or when it comes to, yeah, power related issues that how to continue creating um, that is not so highly dependent on technology. All right, now, unfortunately, we are out of time for these questions, but we do have time for about... <laughs> do we have any questions from the audience? Hi. Um, 
Shoshana, I noticed in the festival program, I think in your festival director's note, there was a mention that your welcome note was written in collaboration with some AI. So I was wondering what the extent of that was and, and how that was used and your choice to do so. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> we have the same name. Yeah, so the whole festival, as many of you might gather by now, has been, we have themes for our different festivals. And, and this year's festival is themed about, around the relationship between new technology and organic knowledge and how one might inform the other or threaten the other or whatever this new thing that, what, where it might be going and taking us. Um, and so in the spirit of trying to be truly in this investigation of this festival that I'm presenting, I, uh, yeah, I opened chat GPT and I said, all right, let's give it a go and see what it did. And, and, um, and, and tried it out in, in the spirit of, uh, it was so interesting because I was writing in prompts about it and if I were writing it, it would be like, oh gosh, what, like very kind of um, cautious about the road ahead. And ChatGPT kept writing things like, puppetry is all about the meeting of new invention with old tradition and was mm -hmm. celebrating that puppetry itself really is a place that, that invites new technology and has always needed um, technology or innovation in that way. And kept, so chat GPT kept framing it in this very positive collaborative light. <laughs> and I found myself in a weird like, oh, interesting point, chat GPT. Um, <laughs> Like, I really didn't think about it that, oh, you use the word innovation and, and instead of, like, new technology. Interesting. I wouldn't have used that word for what you're doing. Like, so I, I was in a learning experience outside my comfort zone. I think I even put a note that it was something I was resistant to as I was writing it and, and figuring out what I would take and what I would leave. Uh, so that's where that all came from as a way to try to be authentic in what we're exploring here and, and have my own little mini exploration in terms of the welcome letter for the festival. I think um, I remember uh, listening, seeing uh, Adrian Kohler from uh, Handspring Puppet Theatre in South Africa, the people who did War Horse, in a lecture, and he said, we are... I might get the century wrong. We are 15th century state-of-the-art technicians. So at some point, somebody said, oh, I'm going to pull a rope, and this will go up, and I'm going to push this, and this will do this. And I think technology has always been developing. So we, we, are, we are still using the, a very pull a rope, push a thing, flip a something or other, <laughs> up comes a thing. And this is just other technology, some of which is super useful. Then, as Day says, the lights go up, the light goes out. We have this in Puerto Rico, as she said all the time. You can't use anything unless you have a generator, which I don't. So you're back to pulling a thing. I'm pulling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know. I was gonna say, besides Q Lab, like I think our, the best piece of technology we put into Feral was when we put casters on the dress. <laughs> Yay! Yes. <laughs> That was great. <laughs> An another question from the audience? Oh. Okay, all right. For the, for the camera, um, you'll have to excuse me. This, this is me and my own curiosity, so, so thank you for letting me step in. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation about uh, courage and curiosity and creativity. And I see each of you as innovators in your own right. And I've been reading a lot, in fact, you know, there's an NPR article about it, but the, the new idea of uh, people have fight, flight, and freeze responses, but there's a new one that's kind of entered the arena, so to speak, affiliate. And I feel that in a lot of this conversation about creative affiliation, technological affiliation, uh, how do you see yourselves as, I guess, artistic affiliators in terms of 
how you see or value uh, collaboration as we kind of round the bend. I think that's, that's kind of the through line that I'm hearing in some of these conversations. And I'm curious if you could speak to that or if you feel anything in that. Maybe, I don't know, maybe it's a little bit of nepotism. Is that what it is when you just hire your friends? <laughs> but it's like, but in a good way, in a, in, in a good way, I'm gonna flip it. <laughs> well, hold on. <laughs> Lights go out. Uh, the, uh, this idea, <laughs> this idea of the pub, like, and I think in, in networks and especially the puppetry network can be very, can feel very small sometimes. And then when we meet people, we bring them in, Indy, and then they stay in, right? <laughs> but, you know, when you, I think when you're in ensemble and when you're with uh, affiliates or colleagues, I think especially in, in this experience, I really wanted to bring my A game, right? Because you want to, because we're all going to be around in this, in this world and we want to bring our best for each other. So I think that's the challenge is, I get to challenge myself because if I'm working on my own thing, I, you know, it's the accountability that Maria was talking about. It's, it's, oh, I see how hard Maria's working. It makes me want to work hard. You know, like I see this collectively, we're building this show and we're so invested. And I think having that affiliation with each other and that passion for the work is so wonderful to be around. And then I get to take that energy into the next ensemble work. Or, you know, I think Day and I were talking about you learn new processes with each other, and then you take that, what you learned there, and you take those processes to, you know, the next uh, group effort. And I think that's, that's really lovely. And, and also, you, you build a trusted network that way. And I think uh, that, and, but nepotism is bad. <laughs> It's on the record. Strong finish. Yeah. Strong finish. Very good. Thanks. Um, I'm curious, Deborah and Shoshana. Uh, I feel like creating something and then also performing in it is a very particular problem that a lot of puppeteers have to figure out how to manage, um, how to see the thing while they're inside it. I'm just curious what tactics you used while creating these pieces. Serendipity, mostly, I'd say. Um, I, I'd, I, we don't work with a director. We, maybe that's a not good thing. We don't use mirrors. Sometimes we might step out and go, oh, that looks awful. <laughs> Let's change this. But I think it's also just a sort of trusting game. When you know what you're working towards and you have a... I think something important is a development of what is the frame. Maybe this is more of a cinematic thing. What is in the actual frame? What are people seeing? And... Um, what was the question again? God, it's been happening to me a lot. How do you, do, how do you stay outside and be in Ah, and then... Okay, so building's one thing. Building is, yes, it's a very distinct thing, but the montage is the exciting thing to me. And that process, for instance, for us, it was one month solid of working day and sometimes nights to create the montage for the, to actually rehearse the show. So it, ha it f fortunately happened and came together actually quite joyfully and quickly, and we just said, we'll take feedback. That My thing is just, to, if people want to give me feedback, I'm super open to, to that. Um, I just trust that it's going to be, you know what, and I think it was Beckett who said, you fail, get up, try again, fail again, fail better. And I think, you know, that's trial and error. Yeah. Um, just to say one thing on that level that we were talking about yesterday uh, at the cabaret <laughs> is that scientists can do things like like build a whole 
crazy expensive rocket ship and it like and then the launch happens it spent zillions of dollars on it and it goes up and it explodes <laughs> and everyone's like yeah that's an advance for science that's that's growth and progress and if you see one bad puppet show the person's like oh terrible i'm never going to talk to them again <laughs> like completely canceled right away and and there's so there's such different standards between mm -hmm. science and art when it comes to failure mm -hmm. and i think that's a very important thing to mark that our relationship with failure is something we need to really look at <laughs> as a as a field um, but that wasn't your question. I just needed to respond to that. Um, I do work with a director. I think it's very important to have someone on the outside because even now with Farrell, I, I have no idea. I, we're like inside a dress. There's, <laughs> we're rolling around a ladder. Like there's no idea what's going on on the outside. There's many moving pieces uh, and I really can't see it when I'm inside. And I think a director's mind to be in the space of making those kind of decisions and facilitating that frame or what we're looking at is a different mind or a different body to be in than a performer's body who's really there to be ready and to make choices and to make propositions and be completely embodying the, the performance of it. So I've, I can't do both at the same time. I mean, we tried a lot, <laughs> a lot and uh, it, it, I don't think it's, uh, it doesn't serve the process as much. And it made me think about how you and Brad work when you're filming, mm -hmm. that you have one, you kind of break it apart like that too. <laughs> you have a director and someone on right. camera. Yeah. You talk about that. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Uh, I mean, with Brad and I met, my partner Brad and I make our films together, and we met on a film crew like 12 years ago, and we just have filmed together a lot, so often, well, Brad has like long professional cinematography experience, so by default, often he ends up being more on camera and then I'm more in a director-producer role, but then we both like to take each other's roles on as well. So sometimes we'll both be filming together and we'll just be looking over at each other and I'll be like, oh, he's on a close-up on Shoshi with the, with the puppet, so I need to be getting stepping back to get a wide and, and it can become like, when it's good, when we're on our game, like it's like a dance and it's really, fun and beautiful that way. Uh, but sometimes, like Brad, if he, like when the day, we spent a day with them doing, filming handheld camera during their rehearsal run through to get some shots that we wouldn't be able to get when they're performing to an audience because we were getting kind of up in their face and stuff. And um, Brad was getting like, uh, you're doing the wolf dance. Oh my God, the footage is so beautiful of you doing the wolf dance. It's so spooky and beautiful and cool. And so much, it's very, dyna it's very dynamic to watch as an audience member in a live performance. But if I'm just to film it wide angle, like the whole stage and days dancing with the wolf, it's not compelling. But when Brad is filming close up with Day, like oh, dancing with Day with the wolves, mm. it is so, gorgeous and I feel like it approximates, it gives you a different, it's the filmed version experience of the performance. And so it has to be, to make it into, unless it's just a straight archival kind of shot of like, this is how the stage looked during the performance. Mm -hmm. That's one thing, but to film it in a way that makes you feel like you're watching it, you know, that, that's what we were trying to do mm -hmm. with the, yeah. I don't know if that was good. When and where do we get to see the film? <laughs> It's gonna be a promotional video, to probably three to five minutes, uh, so that Farrell can get booked at other venues and stuff. So I assume it'll be on the website and everything. <laughs> probably in like a month or so. And with that, that is our panel. Thank you all so much for coming. And thank you guys for your wonderful responses. Do I hand this off to someone?